we continue our exploration of the theme of cooperation and its relevance in sustainability. The thing with cooperation and the principles that allow cooperation is that we can explore these um, across many different contexts and content areas, such as looking at other species, at human evolution, at how cooperation competencies evolve in our lifetime, the cultural diversity of cooperation, or even playing games with students in the classroom to help them understand the role of certain principles in allowing or hindering cooperation. And so in this week, we call it the Educational Design Lab, um, you will explore a range of these concepts and teaching materials around the theme of cooperation in a self-directed way. That means within your project groups, you should discuss and decide how you want to best explore the diversity of content. Consider making decisions on the content that seems most relevant or interesting to you. So that means you don't have to look at and explore all of the content that is offered. And consider also distributing the learning into uh, members or subgroups. And with each group or member being responsible for reporting about what they have learned and how it might be connected to your group's project, uh, the unit plan. You should then also document in your group portfolio how did you make decisions about what content to engage and how to distribute the work. What in this decision-making process worked well and why, or what worked maybe not so well and why and how might you improve the next time. You can also reflect a little bit on, about how this is related to several of the core design principles for a cooperation that we explored last week. You should then also document in your portfolio what kind of content or teaching material you explored and to summarize some of the main ideas, what do you think were some strengths or even weak or weaknesses and challenges, what questions do you still have about the material or what was confusing, and to especially think about opportunities, how you might link these, this content or material to your group project. So in the following slides, I will give a short overview about some of the diversity of materials that you can look at. One area of content is cooperation games. So these are just simple classroom games you can play with students to help them understand the challenges of cooperation and the idea of social dilemmas. Benefits of playing games with students in the classroom is that really students can experience some of the challenges of cooperation directly in class. And you can then refer back to this experience or extend games um, later on to go deeper into concepts. Such games also allow students to practice transfer, transferring the conditions and outcomes of the game to actual real world situations of sustainable resource use and other um, challenges of cooperation. Of course, playing games, preparing games for the classroom does come with some costs, such as time for preparation and sometimes some resources, but with very simple games, they can also be very minimal. So here are an example of teaching materials for classroom games that you can look at. They often are more or less kind of the same. They just are a little bit different in the kinds of materials you need and how more or less abstract uh, they are. Furthermore, um, behavioral scientists also play games with different kinds of people, people of different cultures or different ages, to also help us explore the conditions that allow or hinder humans to cooperate. Here are two teaching materials listed that um, summarize examples of such kinds of games that scientists have played with um, different uh, people to understand, for example, the role of transparency and uh, yeah, feedback on how people behave um, to uphold cooperation. Another kind of area that we can explore to help us understand cooperation, where does it come from, what is the role of these cooperation principles in sustainability, is to look beyond humans to other species in the biological world. Because 
uh, when we think about it, many social species seem to have overcome the tragedy of the commons. Um, they can cooperate and they have been doing though for millions of years, so we can call this pretty sustainable form of cooperation. And we can ask how do they actually do it? Whether it's social insects that, that live in big uh, colonies, or penguins in the Arctic that really have to huddle together and create something of a fair situation so that they can all keep themselves warm. Um, we can look at the mechanisms that allow them um, to suppress any kind of um, tragedy of the commons result. Here's an example actually of a paper where evolutionary biologists really um, summarize some of the ideas of how we can think about the tragedy of the commons in evolutionary biology, looking at different kinds of species and how they, um, what mechanisms allow them to, to cooperate. So overall, evolution is also not just about survival of the fittest individual, but sometimes also survival of the most cooperative group. And so we can look at the different kinds of mechanisms of cooperation that exist across biology. Even within our own body, we have trillions of cells cooperating, keeping us alive and functioning. And so we can think about how the different mechanisms, such as our immune system, the nervous system, um, the blood circulation, how they actually relate to some of those principles that allow cooperation. And so here are two teaching materials that you can explore that um, treat this kind of theme of looking at cooperation across species. Um, Honeybee Democracy is also interesting because it is based on the book of the biologist Thomas Seeley. And he looked at how honeybee democracy colonies make decisions always that are often or most always lead to the best nesting site in the area and to think about how do they do it and how does this compare to how human groups make decisions and how does it compare to our idea of democracy. We can also look at our past as a species. We can look at the char characteristics of our ancestors and their living conditions and also the things they left behind, tools for example to give us some clues about the causes of human behavior and the importance of collaboration in the history of our species. That can really help students understand that cooperation runs really deep in our history and that cooperative environments really shaped our behavior and our mind. So we have a diversity of teaching materials where you can explored really how was cooperation shaped uh, even already millions of years ago in the evolutionary history of our species. We can also explore examples of communities that work well or not so well to understand the importance of Eleanor Ostrom's design principles for cooperation. If you remember Eleanor Ostrom, she explored many different communities around the world that have to use shared resources to understand how do communities achieve sustainable resource use and under what conditions do they fail. And so we can use those kinds of cases also in the classroom to help students understand and, and explore these kinds of conditions um, where, where cooperation and sustainable resource use can succeed. One such uh, example lessons is, we call it three Mexican fisheries. And this is one that lets students understand the fate of three fishing villages in Mexico and compare them by overarching principles and, and challenges, as well as then use these criteria to also reflect on other real world sustainability problems that they know about. For example, the problem of climate change. And another way that you can explore cooperation and social dilemmas with students in the classroom is the use of computer simulations, uh, specifically so-called agent-based models. These are models that really that simulate the behavior of many small agents, um, creatures in a world, and we can observe how their behaviors combined leads to certain outcomes over time. Here's just an example of a very simple such agent-based model of two foresters harvesting a common forest. 
And this can already help students understand why it's challenging to use shared resources and what it means, the idea of a social dilemma, and to then help them reflect on how might, might we overcome this dilemma um, as humans in the real world. And then further computer simulations can add more um, processes and complexity, uh, such as evolutionary processes and other social behaviors that then change how the system evolves over time. Another concept or teaching tool that you can explore is a so-called payoff matrix. It looks like this. Um, it is a way for us to think about when people are in a situation where they have to make a decision about how to behave, what might be their motivations and what outcomes um, does it create. So for example, last week we introduced this situation of a traffic jam where everybody is taking the car and nobody is taking the bus and a payoff matrix can help us better understand the motivations um, that finally actually lead to this outcome. For example, if person A decides to take the bus and also person B or all the other people decide to take the bus, what is their thinking and what kind of outcomes do their behaviors uh, create? Or if one person decides to take the car but the other people decide to take the bus, what kind of uh, motivations are behind this and what outcomes does it create in this kind of social interaction? And so on for all the other uh, fields. This is how we would fill out a payoff matrix, but you can understand and explore this more in the actual lesson. Generally, the payoff matrix is used by evolutionary biologists, economists, and sustainability scientists to represent the costs and benefits that people or sometimes also other animals and living beings get from a behavior in a situation that is a social interaction. And we can use the payoff matrix also as a tool in the classroom to help us reflect on the possible motiv motivations and consequences of behaviors in particular situations. And in this way, a payoff matrix also helps us identify so-called social dilemmas. That is, um, situations where people individually are motivated to behave in a certain way because they seem to be better off in the short term, but only if other people don't do the same thing. The problem is if everybody then decides to behave in a certain way because it's better for them in the short term, it might create outcomes that are actually worse for everybody in the long term. Compared to the situation, if they would behave in a different kind of way that would all allow all of them to be uh, better off in the long term. So this is the essence of the social dilemma that we can identify with the help of a payoff matrix. And so really with the payoff matrix, we can also use it across all the other content, such as computer simulations and co uh, cooperation games to really help us explore some big questions, such as what motivates humans to behave in a certain way in a certain situations? What might be also the role of intuitions and emotions, their beliefs, their personal preferences and goals and learned social norms? So we see here also already the influence of many behaviors of our mind that we will start exploring next week in how ma people make decisions. And the other question, what outcomes does their behavior create and what are the consequences in the certain context? And are those consequences of someone's behavior influenced also by what other individuals do? This is again the essence of the idea of a social interaction. And another question, can benefits and other consequences of a behavior be different between the short term and the long term? So might a behavior be having beneficial outcomes in the short term, but um, negative outcomes in the long term, for example? And this leads also to the question, is there a dilemma between short term motivations of individuals and long term benefits for everyone? And the payoff matrix is such a tool that we can use across many different situations to help us think about and answer these questions. And a final topic you can explore in this week is the idea of nudging. Nudging is simply um, based on the idea that we know that the environment and my environmental factors 
have a strong influence on our behavior. And that is even if we're not always aware of it. We're reacting to our environment often in a unconscious way. And so behavioral economists found that we can change environmental conditions slightly so that they nudge people. So they just kind of slightly nudge them, uh, people to behave more in a way that is better for them and their environment in the long term. But without coercion, without forcing anybody really, without direct prohibitions, without imperatives or economic incentives like giving them money or things like this. And people have experimented with different types of nudges, such as making a more desirable option easier to choose. For example, in the supermarket, help more healthy food, we, we would pos position it in a place where people would more easily see it. Emphasize social norms, appeal to people's self-image and reputation or identity. So simple things like signs that we see that um, everywhere in our environment that try to get us to behave in certain ways can be considered nudges. And the relation to sustainability is especially that there is also the idea of green nudges. These are nudges that are targeting sustainability relevant behaviors, especially behaviors that are about con uh, conserving or using less resources. And so green nudges have been developed more or less successfully for things like reducing towel washing in hotels with signs like this here on the right, or reducing electricity use and littering, reducing use of plastic bags, promoting healthier food choices and reducing food waste. But the thing with nudging, it's also often considered a little bit controversial and this allows also interesting discussions and, and reflections in the classroom about the ethics of nudging, of basically manipulating the environment to make people more behave in a certain way. Can this be considered ethical? Why or why not? And is generally the method of nudging actually a good way to address problems of sustainability? Or is maybe something missing? why or why not? And these kinds of discussions also um, unearth or integrate our ideas about how we think about human behavior and human things like human autonomy and values. Mm -hmm.